You're listening to the Inside the Mix podcast with your host, Mark Matthews. Hello and welcome to the Inside the Mix podcast. I'm Mark Matthews, your host, musician, producer, and mix and mastering engineer. You've come to the right place if you want to know more about your favorite synth music artists, music engineering and production, songwriting, and the music industry. I've been writing, producing, mixing, and mastering music for over 15 years, and I want to share what I've learned with you. Hey folks, and welcome back to the Inside the Mix podcast. If you are a new listener to the podcast, welcome and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Now in this episode, slightly different to usual, it's a a new format that we've got running today. So I'm very excited to welcome our guest today, my friend uh, Violet. So Violet is a music producer seeking to specialize in synth metal and dark synth i heard metal or rather red metal there and it piqued my interest straight away as the audience knows i'm a big metal head um so what we're doing today is what's called a producer kickstart session so we're going to be digging into some mixing and music production bits and pieces with violet uh violet thanks for joining me today how are you hi hi thanks so much for having me uh, I'm, I'm doing great today fantastic and just for our audience listening can you just uh let us know where you're joining us from uh, yeah, I'm uh, a producer from Singapore. Fantastic. Yeah, the, the, I always ask this question because I, I chat to people all around the globe and it's pretty cool. I should get a map on the wall and put pins in everywhere that I've spoken to people oh, yeah. from because uh, I'm, get, I'm getting awesome. about now. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to yeah. do that, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can make a note of that. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's a... It's just huge. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the great thing about it, you know. Um I'm chatting with yourself today in Singapore, and I'm chatting with uh, Color Theory later in the States, and then I'm chatting oh, nice. with uh, yeah, I know, and then I'm chatting with a few others in the UK and someone in the States again. Um, so yeah, it's fantastic. You get to speak to people all over the place. It's brilliant. Um, so as a producer, kickstart session. Uh, what I'd like to just dig in first is just a bit about your where you're at the moment. So we're going to be focusing on mixing today. So where you're at in terms of your sort of knowledge skill set at the moment with mixing and where you think you would like to be in six months? Oh, that's a good question. Um, (laughs) I think like, oh, in terms of where I am with my skill level, I'd say that like I can get a mix sounding like good enough for like the average consumer to just think, you know, hey, this is uh, like it can it sounds pretty standard i'd say like Mm -hmm. um you wouldn't hear i I don't think at least that anyone would any average listener will be be like complaining about specific issues when they hear it nothing's like standing out too obviously yeah um uh, but also like there's also this sort of this issue of you being your own biggest critic and like i'm always like very critical of my own um quality and I'll always be fussing over the little details like, oh, no, did I get the balance right? Is maybe mm-hmm. the base a bit too weak in this or too strong in this? Or um, am I not, you know, in, in terms of mastering, it's always like an issue for me, um, yeah. which is kind of why I <laughs> I approached you for help for that, actually, for one of my upcoming yeah. songs. Yeah. So, like... Um, I guess in six months time where I'd like to see myself is um, I'd like to be able to have a mix that like I could theoretically be like pitching to bigger like like record labels and stuff and like be kind of reach that next level of quality where like even Mm -hmm. those with the trained ear will have a hard time discerning like any faults of it in a sense. And also possibly like reaching a level where I can even, you know, do my own masters at a more professional level. Yeah, yeah fantastic. I guess it's like my yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, the great goals to be honest. And I get what you mean with regards to good enough and and being your your harshest critic because I think we all are our harshest critics when it comes to music oh, yeah, and music production. You know, and. Mm-hmm. It's 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 just a tricky one with a good enough one because we're in mixing there it, it ties in with being your harshest critic in that you, there there has to come a point in mixing where you know there there is a boundary line where you think I've got to put this mix to bed now but at the same time when you are your harshest critic it's so hard to do 
because you're always trying to pick bits and pieces. Is there anything in particular in your mixing, in your productions, that you focus most on when you're criticizing your mixes? Right. Um, I think like the kind of the biggest issue that I struggle with a lot um, is actually like handling my bass. I think it has to do with the fact that I don't really have the best equipment when it comes to like audio. Um, mm -hmm. Like I don't really have super uh, state of the art headphones or like desktop monitors and things yeah. like that. So like it ki I kind of struggle to like really hear the level of my bass as compared to like reference tracks and things like that. And mm. I always find like, one song I'll be like mixing the bass too low and then ne the next song to to compensate for it like I end up going overboard with it and it yeah. becomes too thick yeah it's something that I'm never really like I'm always not really happy with how that part sounds yeah that's the that's one of the trickiest parts and it kind of needs on leads on nicely rather so you sh shared the song sort of vivisection with me and I've, I've had a listen to it and the notes I've made um, are primarily the ones I was going to focus on were going to be in that low end region. Right. Um, and with bass, it is really, really tricky. If you haven't got the monitoring environment, uh, say mon uh, monitors, it's, it's hard because if, you, if you've got a home studio, a lot of the time, unless you're quite lucky in terms of you can build your own home, home studio to a certain specification, you're sort of working with what you have. And the, you're on not the back foot, but it's quite tricky to kick on from there. And then a good pair of headphones can sometimes help with that. Now, you mentioned there about your headphone situation. If you don't mind me asking, what headphones are you using at the moment? <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm a little bit, like, uh, embarrassed <laughs> to even, like, uh, mention <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm mixing, I mix all my songs in, like, a pair of, like, kind of cheap, like, $50 Audio-Technica earphones. Yeah. It's not even a oh, pair wow. of headphones. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm trying to like work up the funds to upgrade. Yeah. I was <laughs> yeah. going to say, you say that, but I, I remember it where I had a, a friend and he the, and he was mixing using Apple earbuds. And because he got so finely attuned oh, wow. to, the frequ yeah, to the frequency response and how they interacted with his music, he was coming out with some fantastic mixes. And it's interesting, again, that there was a conversation I had with Don Morley in episode 54, whereby we were talking about mixing environments. And he was saying that, you, unless you're in a perfect optimum mixing environment, you sort of begin, you adapt to what you have and you start to learn the intricacies of the frequency responses of what you're using. And then you, you sort of, you can create those mixes. So I wouldn't be too perturbed about the fact that you've got the, the cheaper side of headphones. I still think you can come out with good mixes using them. You've just got to learn to know where the, where there's a, there's a peak in the high, um, in the high frequencies or there's a boost a bump in the low frequencies you sort of got to learn to tune your ears to to use those headphones so one thing i was going to say with regards to the low end in particular is now this is a tip i got from oh i can't remember the producer's name um but it was something i saw and he said uh, so you mentioned that you're using reference tracks so when you use a reference right. track are you doing it by ear which is great, which is what I'm an advocate um, for, or are you looking at the frequency content of that reference track as well? I tend to try to look at the frequency content. Um, and usually, like, I'll try to... I'll use, like, visually, like, the frequency and, like, the, the spectrum as, like, a guideline, but I tend to fall towards just using ear because I sometimes don't trust the visuals. Hmm. Yeah. Well, one thing I was going to say then is that's a really good thing to do. So it's great that you're doing that already in terms of your, oh. you're looking at the, the frequency content because there is a limitation to our listening environments if they're not optimum. And sometimes it is, or it is good to use a reference EQ and see, okay, so this is a professional radio friendly track and I can see this, that particular bass region whatever it may be, I don't know, you've got 80, 90, 100 hertz, I can see there's a there's a bump there. So I'm going to try and match that. Obviously, what I wouldn't say is use something like match EQ and just match it like verbatim, because that's probably not going to work. It's not the ideal thing to do. But it, it's great that you're doing that already, because that's what I would say you need to do. So with regards to your right. bass, how are you sort of into playing with the kick drum are you carving out space for the kick in the bass frequencies and vice versa is that something that you do um i i do like side chain my kick drum but um 
the way that I do it, which probably isn't the most, the best method, is I literally side chain it to like the whole bus of everything else. So everything ducks down when the kick comes in. I just personally like how that sounds. I don't know if that's a like more damaging to my mix or not. Um, yeah. So just to clarify that, so are you side chaining your kick to every instrument, or are you side chaining your kick just to the bass? Every, uh, almost everything. Yeah. Oh wow! Minus okay. a few like drum elements. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. That. There. What I'm going to say to that is, there is no hard and fast rule. I mean, if it sounds good, then right, go right, with the golden rule. Go with it. You know. Yeah. Um. Sorry about that. My computer screen just flicked off and it came back on again. That was very weird. Oh yikes. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> threw me right off. I don't. I thought I'd lost everything. Then began to panic. Oh, that's um, like a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just went totally black. That was weird. Um, but it's still recording, so that's good. So, um, yeah, where was I going with that? Yeah, yeah. I was um, <laughs> talking about the. Um, yeah, there are no, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to music. You know, if it sounds good and it adds to your track, then do it. Um, I did notice in that track. Do you side? You, I mean, you're side chaining the guitars as, as well. I'm assuming then. Yeah, but pretty right? much everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, my my immediate response would be once again, this is my own personal opinion, is that if I'm going to do that, I might vary the level of side chain with the instruments. I don't know if they're all at the same level. Ooh. Does that make sense? Right. That does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just going to have that same level of pumping throughout the whole track and if it's different for the different instruments that could add a bit more interest throughout the track that's going slightly off topic with regards to bass um mm. but side chaining is good with bass i mean if you're side chaining bass you're making room for that kick drum to come through <clears throat> i mean another way you could do it is if you've got i don't know if you've ever used a, a multi-band compressor or you have access to one i have and I don't have much experience with it, so I haven't really like been able. I haven't like really experimented with it enough. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to use it. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. What I was going to say is, with a multi-band compressor, something like the Waves C6, others are available. Um, you can pick out right. the, the the specific frequency of the kick drum and just duck that frequency notch in your bass. However. That's from a mixing perspective. So if you want your bass, your kick drum to come through, poke through your bass, um, that would work. But if you're doing it from like a creative perspective, so you've got that pumping, then I would just stick with the whole of the bass being side chained, if that makes sense. Right, I hope it right. does. Um, but one thing I would definitely look at doing is varying the levels of side chain you've got going on with your instrument groups, just to make it a bit more interesting. I'm assuming you're, you're side chaining your synths as well. Yeah, That'd everything right. is going into that sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, excellent. What about guitars? Do you, I mean, are those VST guitars you've got going on there in that track? Yeah, so like for the first track, like that included guitars, which would be the section. At that point in time, I did not yet have. Um, I believe at that point in time, I didn't have an audio interface, so mm. I I just used like. Um, a VST guitar coupled with a synth that I designed that I tried to emulate the sound of a guitar with. So it was like two uh, layers. Yeah. But it was cool. not a real guitar. No, that, that's fine. What I was going to say is, um, have you double tracked that guitar? Is it just one guitar? Is it left and right? I believe at that point in time, it was not double tracked. It was just stereo because of the way that I designed the synth. It was just like stereoized. I see, I see. Well, one one yeah. other thing I was going to say is, and um, this kind of plays into that low end again, is what you might want to consider doing, this is coming from my metal background now. So when I was playing oh. metal, we would double track guitars. We might have even quadruple tracked. I know Metallica did it on um, uh, the Black Album, but it depends on, on your overall mix and what you're going for. But double tracking guitars is a great idea. So you can have one hard pan left and one hard pan right. No, we did quadruple. No, no, it's double. So I did my my guitars and the other guitarists did theirs. But what I would uh, say is have on the left side, you have one guitar and on the right, you have the other, but make them subtly different. So you might have uh, a slight 
treble boost in the guitar on the right, or you might have a slight low end boost in the guitar on the left or something along those lines. Because if they're the exact same when you pan them left and right, you'll hear this. There's an episode that goes out on Tuesday with Adrian Hall and he says this, if you pan it hard left, hard right, and it's exactly the same, it almost, it doesn't, but it kind of almost sums to mono, if that makes sense. So you want to have those right. sort of variations in sound left and right. And it's the same with synths as well. If you're hard panning synths left and right, I don't know if you do that with your pads or do you have one pad down the middle or is it just a stereo pad? Pads. Um, usually when it comes to like my instrument arrangement, I tend to have different instruments in different parts of the stereo field. So I'd have, I'd probably have like my pads more on the left and then like something else more on the right. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what I was going to say is it kind of falls in line with pads as well. So you're already doing right. that, which is great, where you have those those different sounds, both left and right, because that will then enhance that stereo width that you have. Um, so it's good that you're doing that already. But what I would say is, if are you going to be tracking guitars? And if you, are you a guitarist yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I use real guitars in my songs. Oh, so, fantastic. Oh, no, yeah, I was just going to say that, like, uh, I'm definitely keen to do like tracking and stuff. I think like you did give me feedback for my other track that other time um, mm. about tracking, which I really appreciated. And like, it really did give like a lot of life to the, um, to the whole track as a whole. Yeah. So Fantastic. it's definitely something I'm playing with a lot. That's great to hear. So, so going back to your, the, the, the base region, cause I'm, I'm aware of time. So with the base region that you mm -hmm. have there, you have your bass, whether it's a synth, uh, like an ar arpeggiated pattern or bass guitar or something like that. Is it just one bass or are you layering bass sounds? And do you use a sub bass sound as well? Uh, yeah, usually I will layer like a bass sound with a sub bass and then I'll cut out like the subs from the original bass. So oh, that fantastic. I'll have it like separate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's what my next question was going to be. So you're doing that already, which is great, because um, that, that's what I was going to say, because otherwise you're just frequencies on top of frequencies, and then you're overloading that that sort of frequency range right. there. So that's fantastic you're doing that. And then do you have any upper frequency content in your bass as well? And is it... Actually, answer that one first. So your upper frequency content, do you have anything above sort of like the low mids, the high mids with your bass? Uh, typically, yes. I usually like... Intent, uh, intentionally like induce higher frequencies with like distortion or things like that just to like help it like pop out a bit i don't know if that's how you're supposed what you're supposed to do with basses but yeah no no once again it's i was just just intrigued to see or find out rather what you're doing in terms of your frequency content with bass up and down the spectrum and it's one of those ones again it's there are no rules and it's going to leads on what i was going to say next is with regards to the stereo width in the low end Anything below right. sort of 100 hertz, do you have it sort of like mono or do you have some sort of stereo spread? Have you got bass in the stereo spread below sort of 100 hertz? Yeah, I usually keep my uh, bass, my low bass, like as mono as possible. Like my sub mm -hmm. is fully mono and that's usually it's about there around like maybe 80 hertz and below is all mono. Not sure about 100. Maybe I should. Yeah. I probably should like keep that in mind next time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, to be honest with you, when I say a hundred, it's it's an arbitrary number. I was just picking one out right. of the air. So I mean, eighty. If eighty works for you, then then stick with eighty. But with regards to you, I know you mentioned earlier about saying that your bass sometimes you don't think it's loud enough, or maybe it's too, and then you overcompensate in your next mix. It might be worth once again. It goes back to saying there are no rules really. Maybe trying what it sounds like with a slight stereo width in that low region if you've if you're thinking actually you know what this bass really isn't kicking through in my sub bass maybe not sub bass oh, but your your lower yeah just try it um just try it out just not obviously like hard left hard right but just add a bit of width to it and see what it does because it might just help it open up a bit more um when you're when you when you are do you use a uh like a i always get them around the wrong way it is a high low no high pass filter do you high pass filter the low end sort of like to get rid of any rumble is that something that you do in your mixing um pr high passing probably not uh wait hold on I'm, i also get this mixed up a lot is yeah the i one know where you cut away the highs or are you cut away the no it's, it's the one away <laughs> yeah i know i always do it i, I did a <laughs> i did a um a video last week and i had to second guess myself 
high oh, pass gosh. is where <laughs> yeah i know is where you're only allowing the higher the pre the frequencies to the right to come through so if you put a high pass filter right, right. uh 20 yeah. hertz anything above 20 hertz will come through yeah so i definitely do that for my basses i do that for like most of my of my audios of my instruments actually and is that are you using a, a shelf filter or is that uh, a high pass sorry a shelf, uh, not shelves. I mean, a, a high pass. Like I completely cut out like the stuff that goes below. Also, not too sure if it's the right number. Probably eighty. Probably higher. Yeah. So what I was going to say to that is, this is something I learned from from chatting with Mike Exeter because I I was of the mindset to do that myself as well. And it right. could also when you're when you find that your low end is lacking in your mix. It could be worth looking at that high pass filter and maybe switching it out for like a um, a low shelf instead, which doesn't attenuate all the frequencies, but rather you could sort of attenuate, I don't know, 100 hertz. You might attenuate 5 or 6 dB instead, if that makes sense. That's a really interesting idea. I yeah, not even thought of that. No, neither had I, because he put the point across was like that – frequency that 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 sound is there for a reason and when you send it to mastering if there's nothing there the mastering engineer hasn't got anything to work with now it's not necessarily going to mix or sorry sorry it's not necessarily going to work with everything but if you are finding that you're it's lacking anything maybe just try switching it out and putting a a um what did i say a low shelf in there instead and then right. just just ducking it rather than a, a high pass filter and getting rid of it altogether. i hope that makes sense i think it does that does make sense yeah Oh, fantastic that's like that does open up quite a few doors for me <laughs> brilliant brilliant well by the way that's 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 20 minutes in now so i hope that's been of some use to you um i mean i could i could chat about sort of mixing and all these bits and pieces all day but i'm hoping that you can take something away from that there from what i've said yeah, definitely fantastic and um for our audience uh listening if they want to go and find out and listen to your music where could they find you online Right. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Like, uh, uh, no problem. If <laughs> if you'd like to find more of my music, you can find me at like I have this handy dandy link for everything. It's a link tree. So that's linktr.ee slash vylt music. No caps, no spaces. Or you can just search me up as vylt or violet. Um, you'll probably find some of my pages somewhere. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, uh, thanks so much for having me on this on this uh, episode. No, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for joining me on this. I'll um, I'll put a link in the episode notes so the audience can go and click on that link tree link and check out your stuff as well. Once again, oh, a big thanks. It's, yeah, no, not a problem, not a problem. Um, and folks, if you want to be like my friend here, Violet, and become a producer kickstart uh, participant. Go to the website www.insidethemixpodcast.podia.com forward slash free and get signed up and come and join me on the show. We can chat about your music and um, much like we've done today. So, Violet, a big thank you and um, thanks for joining me on this and enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Hi, I'm Chewy. I go by Chewy Beats and my favorite episode is 66 because it showed me a new approach of writing lyrics and yeah, I'll try that in my next one.